All right, until we bring the streetcars back, chapter two. Tom Bradford and Lola Muldoon caught up when I was blasting out of the building after seventh period. They were going together and it was hard for me, but I had to get used to it because they were really stuck on each other. I almost dropped my marble too soon, Lola said, and laughed in a way that made me ache inside. The best looking girl in the senior class, she made boys gulp and whistle silently through their teeth when she'd walked, walk in the hallways and I'd see them take a second look as if their eyes had made her up or something. You won't be able to play in the Harding game, Tom said. Yeah, just because of that screwball girl, I said. Ahead of us, I spotted her, her hurrying to a black Plymouth waiting on Marshall Avenue. That's her. That's her, I pointed. Who is that? Gretchen Letterman, Lola said as the skinny girl slid into the car and it pulled away into traffic. Is she new, I asked. She was in Heigler's social studies with me when we were juniors, Lola said, chewing her gum like mad and snapping it ever, ever so often. I remember she started late after we'd been going for a few, a few weeks. Some kids called her Gretch the Wretch. She said her dad was going to whip her or something. I said, what a queer. My mother would have a cow if she knew I dropped a marble, Lola said. We crossed Marshall in a dash between the rush hour traffic and legged in the two blocks along Dunlap, catching a streetcar coming up Selby. Selby. You coming, Tom said, hurrying with Lola. Nah, I'm going to hitch, I said, and I let them run ahead to catch the Shelby Lake. When I reached the corner, the folding doors swallowed them and the yellow streetcar roll rolled away. I caught a glimpse of Lola through a side window and I almost got kicked, killed crossing Selby because I wasn't looking at the cars, thinking about how well I'd keep it, kept it secret. I'd been in love with her since we were sophomores, but I didn't even tell my good buddies, Jerry and Steve, because I didn't want them kidding me about her. It was too painful. She dated some big wheel upperclassmen most of her junior year until during the summer when Tom asked her out. And the first thing I knew they were going together. She wore her blonde hair longer than most of the girls down to her shoulders and her eyes were some kind of blue. I'm not very hot when it comes to colors. I mean, I basically know red and green and yellow and all, but when it comes to the two million in between, I don't know most of their names, but whatever her eyes were, when she trained them on you, it was like getting shot. I was always trying to decide if I'd go out with some other girl, lowering my expectations, or go in alone and dream about Lola. I didn't have my thumb out for, for long when a guy with a schnoz like Jimmy Dante, Durante gave me a ride in his new four-hole Buick. His hair was all slicked back and he smelled like a barber shop. I like to hitchhike, not just for the money I saved, but I loved cars and I got to ride in a lot of new and different ones. And sometimes the drivers would even open the hood and show me their engines. I'd seen a Lincoln V12, a Kaiser inline six, and an Oldsmobile Rocket V8. I never mentioned hitchhiking around my dad or anything about cars because he'd blow a gasket. When the guy in the four hole dropped me off, I hinted about seeing his engine, but he didn't catch on. I walked half a block along Fairview, and when I turned up our alley, I could hear kids playing in one of the yards, shouting and laughing and having a good time. I looked through a lilac hedge and couldn't believe my eyeballs. Four lousy grade school boys had snared a cottontail and had it staked out with a string tied to one of its hind legs. The little creeps were taking turns throwing a homemade spear at the rabbit, a long willow stick with an open jackknife tied to one end, and the bunny leapt and jerked like crazy and kept crashing the, to the ground when it hit the end of the string. I shot through the hedges and yelled, you little pricks, and I scared the crap out of them, and they took off in all directions. The cottontail tugged against the string and was flopping all over the place until I kneeled and grabbed it and held it in my lap. 
While I worked on at untying the knot, I kept talking to the little bugger, trying to calm it down. Its leg was raw and bloody where the string was cinched, and a couple of bleeding cuts showed that those little brats had been at it for a while. When I got the knot untied, I nestled the rabbit in my jacket and zipped it up, and after the bunny flopped around a little, it settled down. I noticed the lousy spear lying on the ground, and I stomped my foot across the jackknife, and it sat, snapped off the blade. When I came in the back door with a cardboard box I'd found in the alley and the cocktail sticking his head out of my jacket, my mother hit the ceiling. A rabbit? My mother hit the the ceiling a lot, but I could tell when she was really hitting the ceiling or just pretending. What she was doing then, because I knew she loved animals, and her first reaction to anything unexpected was to hit the ceiling and then figure out what to do on her way down. You know pets aren't allowed in our building, she said, and I could tell she wanted to touch the little thing, but she stayed over by the stove where she was cooking dinner. My dad was the caretaker of the building, so we got our apartment for less rent, and we all helped with the work, even my little sister. But my parents were real careful not to break any rules so the other five families couldn't rat on us to the owner. Can't we keep him just until he heals up, I said. Some dirty little kids were torturing him. I tried to make it sound as horrible as I could because I knew that basically my mother had a soft heart. Peggy, my 12-year-old sister, must have heard us because she came blasting into the kitchen from the bedroom. Oh, a bunny, please, mom, she said. Please, please. My mother turned and stirred something on the stove. Well, just overnight and then you have to let it go. I unzipped my jacket and set the little bugger in the box and Penny kneeled and started to pet it. Oh, he's all yucky, she held up a bloody hand. I pulled off my jacket as my mother turned and this time she really hit the ceiling. Kelvin, look at your shirt. It's ruined. And your jacket. It's on your jacket, too. It's just blood, I said, noticing the stains for the first time. I don't know why, but I always say it's just as times like that. It's just paint. It's just inedible, inedible ink. It's just human gore. Crimey. I don't know why I do that. It only makes it worse. She snatched the jacket from me and held it up for a closer look. Just blood? Blood won't come out. Who's going to pay for this? My mother was always stewing about what something would cost. Like I'd never been able to buy another jacket until I was 53 years old or something. She hung the jacket over the back of the chair and turned to the stove. Go take off your shirt before your father gets home. We'll have to soak them in cold water and don't mention the rabbit. Put the box in your closet. Peggy picked up the box and headed to my room. If you'd leave well enough alone, you wouldn't be covered with blood, my mother said. Would you want me to let them kill it? I pulled off my shirt and waited for her answer. But I knew I had her, and I knew she wouldn't answer. So while she made a lot of noise rattling pans around the stove so she could ignore me, I bombed out of there. When my mother wanted to ignore you, she could win the North American Ignoring Championship, and it was a waste of time to hang around. On the day... On the way to my room, I felt pretty good. The cottontail had a safe home for the night, but when I saved the bunny from those little pricks, I never would have guessed in seven million years that it would have had anything to do.